Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, April 21st, 2020 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Didier today went back to an earlier diary where he looked at the K-Pot info stealer and uh, back then he ended up with an obfuscated auto IT script. Now, today he analyzed this auto IT script in a lot more detail and a real nice example sort of how to go through the different obfuscation steps being used here to actually arrive at the final result that's supposed to be executed here. It all started with with what looks like a certificate. But well, certificates are really just a base 64 encoded data. And when you decode this particular certificate, you end up with the actual script that's being executed. But this is not where it stops. This script is heavily obfuscated. And what did he eventually ended up with was actually some shell code. And this shell code is is then being executed using process hollowing. Process hollowing is a pretty neat trick to bypass a lot of defensive techniques. What it basically does is it creates a process in a suspended state and then when the memory is unmapped, it just replaces that memory with malicious code. So this way, essentially you can sort of swap the memory of a process that's considered uh, benign that's already running. Now, similar technique actually process injection, uh, which sort of also basically uses a legitimate process, a process that has already been vetted in order to execute malicious code. DD is also pointing out some differences between the static analysis he's doing here and dynamic analysis in that the mutex being created here by the process usually should have a random name, but doing static analysis, uh, you always end up with the same mutex name. Frenchy shellcode 06 also identifies this as Frenchy shellcode, which is a very common uh, exploit being used for process hollowing. And apparently the attacker here adapted uh, this particular shellcode. The DA did a nice job in laying everything out there. So if you ever run into some obfuscated auto IT script, definitely something for you to look at to understand how to decode it. And then we got an interesting vulnerability in field programmer gate arrays or FPGAs that may lead to the leak of proprietary information that's used to encode these FPGAs. Now, the big advantage of FPGAs is that they are reprogrammable. So it's kind of like being able to adjust the hardware to your liking. So you kind of get the flexibility of software and sort of regular CPUs and the speed of custom hardware. That's sort of at least the idea of it. Now, the problem with this approach, of course, is how do you secure the software? How do you make sure that you actually work with an authentic FPGA that runs the right code and how do you keep that code secret because these functions that you're sort of encoding in the FPGA well uh, they may contain proprietary information well uh, the designers thought about it and they will encrypt the bitstream that's being used to actually do the programming turns out uh, there is a fundamental weakness in how the bitstream encryption is done in the Silinx 7 series of FPGAs and due to this weakness it's actually possible to use the processor itself as an oracle and use it to at least decrypt bits and pieces of the bitstream without much effort. Really neat technique and while it does of course require sort of physical access uh, to the FPGA it's still a very valid and significant vulnerability because one reason people like like these FPGAs is that uh, the data is considered secure and as a result they're often used in sort of critical control applications. And IBM's X-Force released uh, three advisories with uh, vulnerabilities in Nagios 
Xayar Nagios 11. Now, the first one of these vulnerabilities is probably the most severe one. It's a SQL injection vulnerability that does not require any authentication. The two other vulnerabilities look a little bit more severe because they're actually remote code execution vulnerabilities, but they do require authentication. Not clear if the SQL injection vulnerability could potentially be used uh, to gain access uh, to uh, gain access to authentication parameters. The advisories are very small. It's just uh, literally sort of one sentence. And that's probably due to there not being a patch available at this point for any of these vulnerabilities. Well, and that's it for today. Thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.